In today's video, entirely by accident, I happen to have come across a brilliant value graphics card, which also just happens to be borderline the exact same chip in the Xbox One. Now this right here is the AMD Fire Pro W5000, a card that I accidentally stumbled across while browsing through eBay looking for something that might actually resemble a good value graphics card. When out of nowhere, and this very rarely happens on eBay, it actually recommended me a good card with this here Fire Pro. They're commonly selling between £30 and £50 pounds globally. I played about the £40 mark because I just was so amazed at the price that I just leaped at it. It's based on the GCN architecture, it's got decent specs, no need for external power, and it ticked every single box. Right up until the discussion about this card actually broke out in my Discord, and I realised it lined up spec for spec with the original Xbox One. Something that we're going to be touching on later on in the video, but before that we have to find out what exactly are the specs of this card. So AMD's Fire Pro W5000, quite the name, not very catchy, was a relatively high-end workstation card operating as essentially a cut-down HD7870, where it sort of was at that HD770 levels of power, despite actually being a more powerful card. All sounds very similar, doesn't it? Released in late 2012, it serves as a GCN1 based card on the Pitcairn, Pitcairn? Pitcairn, however you say it, based architecture, complete with 768 shading units, 2GB of GDDR5 based VRAM, basic DirectX 12 support, modern drivers, it sips power at best, and it can even overclock. In fact, overclocked, it still peaks out around 48 watts full usage, meaning every system in existence can run this card, and with them being very cheap globally right now, that's a very compelling sell. Being a cut down card, it still maintains a lot of extra features as well, so it's got great API support, as well as good hardware acceleration in the form of AMD VCE, admittedly an older variant of it. The question remains though, what makes this the Xbox One graphics card? I mean, it's all well and good me reading off a spec sheet, but how does it compare to the console itself? Now to the nitty gritty console comparison stuff. Most people that talk about the most comparable graphics card to the Xbox One leap to one of two cards, either the R7 260 or HD7 770. Both great cards, I like them both, and both of which are very close. But they both seem to miss out on a few areas. So let's start with the closest one, the R7 260. Spec for spec, it lines up almost exactly with the Xbox. But the issue is, it's too new. It's GCN2, which comes with a lot of nice advantages the Xbox frankly doesn't have. Free sync, better VCE support, better API support, stuff like that. Then we have the HD7770, famously compared to the Xbox One by the absolutely excellent Greenham Gaming video that I do recommend everyone goes and watch. And although very similar in performance, it is lacking in the same specs. It's GCN1, the same. It's of semi-similar performance, that's pretty good. So it is somewhat comparable, until we get this Fire Pro here and throw it into the mix. See, the Xbox One is famously the same graphics core as the PlayStation 4, but cut down. Ring any bells to how this Fire Pro is essentially a neutered HD 7870, a bit like how the PS4 itself is a 7870, or at least around that mark. So it gives you an idea of how good this Fire Pro lines up. The only real difference is, is one area. Other than that, it's before the Xbox One's release date, it has virtually the same specs, it has virtually the same architecture, and it came from the exact same bloody cut down full core. But don't worry, I've actually got comparisons of every card in this list, so if you don't agree with this, you can make up your own mind later on in the video when I compare the Xbox One, the HD7770, the R7260, this here Fire Pro, and possibly I'm going to throw in the Xbox One X, but that's only because I've got one lying around and I quite like it. I'm pairing this with my normal Ryzen system using the latest stable drivers released from AMD. Now just because this is the Xbox One's graphics card doesn't mean that it isn't a great card in its own right. I didn't exactly expect all too much from this device given the frankly quite poor things we've actually heard about developing for the original Xbox One. However keep in mind this is a cheap, low power card not even made for gaming. I've still actually got it in my system because the results surprised me so much. So I hope you guys are actually going to enjoy this in the benchmarks. 
Starting off the benchmarks with one of the oldest games in the benchmark suite today as I've gone through and updated it, we have GTA 5. Seen here running with 1080p high settings and anywhere between 50 and 60 FPS on average. A genuinely very playable and actually good experience. Setting for setting, it is around the Xbox One in terms of graphical fidelity, however with the Fire Pro we are seeing almost twice the frame rate. Something impressive no matter how you cut it. The game looked good, ran great and even under an intensive action, the game never really strayed far away from that 50 FPS mark. Next on the list we're ramping the intensity right up with Red Dead Redemption 2. A game that notoriously struggles on the Xbox One console with a few frame rate drops and looks quite blurry. I found however on the PC, the game looked a lot sharper and less blurry on this Radian, and did manage to stay above that 30fps mark a lot of the time, even in action. The VRAM limits on this game do make it rather annoying though as I had to configure the game and then restart, configure and then restart, and just had to do that so we could actually get some nicer settings. In the end we had medium settings generally, which definitely assisted in making the game look quite nice, so things like textures would be on low, but the shaders made up for it. Continuing on from this we have the Halo Master Chef collection, which once again ran flawlessly and with the default settings in a 1080p resolution we rarely saw any frame drops. Whether you tried multiplayer, firefight or the campaign, we're talking it was about the same across the board. Not saying that should be all too surprising considering this game is generally very well optimised regards to the platform you actually run it on, or the graphics card you run it on. That is of course unlike the latest release in the Halo series. Halo Infinite almost worked, but didn't. Generally, we'd either run into issues with the game seeing our graphics card was a virus, which has happened a few times over the years, or it would say that we didn't have the right DirectX 12 level. So occasionally we'd make it into game, but there would be graphical glitches and then the game would promptly crash, something that was only accelerated by trying to record this process with OBS. Whether it's drivers, the game, or a mixture of both, the Xbox One does actually have the advantage here by actually starting the game. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord I didn't expect to work, given that this Fire Pro is often compared to the HD7770 for good reason, and that card does struggle here. However this thing, well it ran brilliantly, with medium settings, a HD resolution, the game remained very playable with a great frame rate and looked nice too. Admittedly it was the shaders once again that are responsible for this, as that 2GB of VRAM just isn't enough to push high textures. Still, it did a good job covering up the 720p resolution, and either way was a very impressive showing. BeamNG is something that people always request me to test. So in 720p with a mixture of medium and high settings, the game was more than capable of running at around 60fps or higher. The more intensive maps would reduce this down to the 40 to 50fps mark, but for the most part, considering how intensive this game can be on the CPU and GPU, I was very impressed with the results, and I don't think you'd be able to get this running this nice on console. By this point you can probably tell that my benchmark suite really has been upgraded to the latest and greatest titles. We had Star Wars Fallen Order which defaulted to the exact right settings with a mixture of medium and high. It did also turn on dynamic resolution but given I'd already selected to run the game in 720p it didn't make a great deal of difference either way. Things looked great and it certainly ran smoother than the original Xbox One which I know for a fact suffers with heavy frame drops even in the starting sequence. Crisis Remastered is definitely not something I expected to be testing, mostly because the cards I test quite often struggle with the original Crisis, yet alone the latest release. Still with medium settings the game looked absolutely brilliant and this was actually my first experience with the game as I've only just downloaded it. I can however assure you that the card was not a bad way to experience this game at all. You do lack ray tracing and DLSS, but that's kind of expected given one is an Nvidia exclusive and there's no way the Xbox One or the W5000 can actually do either of these. And then to bring us to our conclusion, where would we be without a quick CSGO benchmark? It ran phenomenally. I used the competitive 1024x768 settings with a mixture of low and high options and results can speak for themselves. Even in the very intensive workshop benchmark it ran really well with 3 to 400 FPS on average and of course casual, competitive and deathmatch modes 
Well, they operate at a similar 3 to 400 and even 500 FPS. Overall, not half bad for something that can be found in an old console for about 35 quid. Now, I would argue those benchmarks are extremely impressive in their own right. A lot of the latest and greatest titles are running here with respectable settings as well as a HD resolution, something that we aren't often used to on this channel as I usually end up running GTA 5 and 240p. Most games ran really smooth and I've been using this a lot at the moment in my downtime, it's still in my system. I've actually been playing a lot of older and simple titles like RimWorld and Project Zomboid at 1440p, 144Hz with no issues whatsoever. Yes, you do lack free sync support, however it's not the worst thing in the world because I was able to play any game I owned with decent settings and resolution. Question is though, how does it compare against the Xbox itself and the other cards like AMD's own HD7770 and R7260? Well, things are interesting. Now, my Xbox One has long since been given away to a family member, however, I've had a video like this in the works for a while, so I actually did quite a chunk of benchmarking when I happened to actually have the Xbox One on hand, so thankfully I've actually got benchmarks. Overall, it does seem like the Xbox's Jaguar CPU, even with that fast ES RAM and optimizations, aren't actually enough to give the Xbox One the edge. The Fire Pro seems to generally manage either a higher resolution or frame rate, and the main thing the Xbox One has going for it is stability and guaranteed compatibility, at often lower settings though. However, it was quite quick, the HD7770 quickly dropped off in newer titles, and even the R7260, despite its newer API support, did seem to suffer a tad more than this here Fire Pro. With only the W5000 and Xbox One showing a degree of parity towards the latest and greatest titles. It's also worth noting that I'm going to chuck my Xbox One X in here to give an idea of how it compares to a frankly fantastic console and the next leap up in the Xbox range. All in all, you do actually get better performance than a next-gen console. Well, I don't know if it's still called next-gen, whatever we're calling it. Either way, it costs about 30 to £50 pounds globally, and something that could definitely help a lot of us budget gamers out there get this sort of next-gen performance for cards that you can actually just buy. I haven't actually been able to say that about any card in the last 18 months. Overclocking is also quite feasible on the card. I used MSI Afterburner and couldn't quite hit 1GHz, but got quite close to it. Memory also seemed to be able to go up to near the same mark as well. Generally, I think with some voltage increases, you could extract even more performance from these cards as they are binned really well being from workstation environments. As even in this overclocked state, the card never got hot, it never got loud, and it didn't actually use all too much power, really going to show that using this cut down approach does offer you a lot of performance at a flexible price. And it also goes to show how AMD could actually match Nvidia for power consumption if they stopped over vaulting every single card to all hell. Looking at you, completely pointless RX 500 series rebrand, useless series thing. Then finally, to round us off, as I did want this to be a very in-depth review of a surprisingly competent card, I have some video acceleration in editing. I've actually edited most of this video on this card with little to no issues, and drivers are specifically optimised with these computing-based tasks. I've had no crashes, nor any issues with installation. And you also get a frankly lovely looking UI with these drivers, and plenty of monitoring metrics. Even VC on the card, albeit its original implementation, at high enough settings, it looks alright. I'll dump some video recordings here, streaming quality settings aren't great, but in general high quality recordings do actually work alright. So there we are at the conclusion, we have both a budget buy an Xbox One Wonder and a beautifully performing card, all in one video. I really hope that those of you needing a budget card can actually go and find one of these after this video goes out, as currently, as of the time of making this script, they're available on AliExpress, refurb sites, eBay and Facebook Marketplace. These have made it into plenty of workstations, they've not had a tough life, and they were sold in such high quantities that now they're being replaced, they are simply flooding the market without anyone currently noticing. I hope you all found this quite interesting, I know that I did, this has definitely taken a rather turn from a rather mundane budget buy benchmark video to quite an in-depth video on a weird Xbox One equivalent card. So thank you very much for watching and good night.